been talking about going into all the nations and uh, reaching different cultures, and sometimes they've tried to kill us when we go there, and sometimes we have to do things like eat with them, but let's, uh, let's pray for our kids real quick before they go. And praise the Lord for VBS this weekend, right? That was, this week was amazing. Thank you all the workers and the servants and the children for coming and parents. So let's pray. Father, thank you for our young people, Lord. We ask you to bless them as they seek your word. Bless the teachers, Father. Raise up new laborers, Lord, new teachers. And just be glorified as we serve you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing and what you will do, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, be blessed. So we've gone to other cultures and nations, and they've, we've had to eat with people, and we've had to be killed by them sometimes. That's what happens to some Christians in other lands when you get a different culture facing your culture. And um, so today we're going to be continuing that series on this whole thing about Christ and culture. And we're going to go to the market today. We're going to go buy a melon. We're going to go to an old market. And let me ask you a question real quick before we get into this whole discussion. Is this a sin to eat this melon? Is this a sin to eat a cantaloupe? Is it? Are there some of y'all doubting? Like, are you doubting? Any, anybody doubting? Like, I don't know what he's trying to get at here. Well, we'll talk, uh, we'll talk about the, water, uh, the cantaloupe in a little bit. But let's take you to an a, uh, ancient, ancient, the very first shopping mall ever. The very first shopping mall ever was called um, the, uh, what's it called? Uh, I can't read that. Oh, Tra- 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 Trajan's Market. Trajan's Market is in Rome. And it was built by Emperor Trajan, and it was one of the biggest, first big markets that, that kind of was like a shopping mall. And the bottom floor was called the Via Biberatica. Biberatica. It's, uh, I guess that's Italian or something. Does it sound like something in Spanish? Biberatica, biber, 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 biber? Biber, right? Biberatica, it's the drinking path. And when you go to the market to buy your melons, you also had to go by the drinking path, the pathway of drinking. And guess what they were doing there? Bebiendo, they were drinking. And it wasn't just grape juice, they were drinking, okay? These were, this was Rome, okay? And if you see a map of this, it's right, uh, you can, it's hard to tell, but there's a little dot right there, and just right three, 250 meters away was the temple of Venus Genetrix. Anybody know what Venus Genetrix was? You know Venus, right? The goddess of what? Love. The goddess of love. And you know what they did at Venus's temples? Anybody have an idea what they did at Venus's temples? They made love at Venus's temples. They had temple prostitutes there. And so when you're going to buy your melon, you could go by and get drunk a lot. And then if you wanted to just swing by the temple and worship a little bit, and worship with the prostitutes, and then go home to your wife. Any wives? Would you like, guys like that idea? Your husband going to worship at Venus's temple? Well, that's what happened all the time in the Roman culture. And then people would become Christians, and so now they're trying to figure out what to do. And so Paul writes in this section, and this is important because we're asking the, talking about cultures and how Christians navigate culture and the culture that we live in. Can you imagine trying to navigate that culture? And it's really, actually, if you think about it, it's no different than ours, and we'll get into it as we go. So 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3 says this, now concerning things sacrificed to idols. So you'd have these temples, and you'd go buy your meat, and by the way, the meat had earlier been sacrificed at the idol. So you go, now where do you guys buy your meat? Anybody buy, where do you guys go? Carniceria, H-E-B, Right? L-A-C-B. Anybody go to Walmart? Walmart, H-E-B. You go to different places, right? None of us think that the meat there at H-E-B has been sacrificed to a god before we got it. But if you would have gone to the Roman markets, that's what, what it would have been. So, oh, some chicken breast has been uh, offered to Zeus and some, some uh, you know, fajitas for our piratas that have been offered to Venus, Okay. So anyway, Paul says, concerning the things sacrificed to idols, we know we all have knowledge. Guys, we know what's going on. But here's the deal. 
Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. So before he gets into the discussion of culture, he put, wants us to frame our minds around this idea. You can know something and be all proud about what you know and be arrogant, and that's different than being loving and edifying. If anyone supposes he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. By the way, that's just a real quick note to say in here. The older you get, and some older folks in the group might be able to agree with me on this one, or maybe not, but the older I get, the less I know. Like when I was young, I knew everything. And when I was a new Christian, ah, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's obviously wrong. No, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And now I'm like, well... I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's certain things that are, we know we're wrong, but there's other things like, eh, is it okay to eat this or not? I don't know. We'll find out. Anyway, if anyone supposes he knows anything, he's not yet known as he ought to know. If anyone loves God, he is known by him. So there's the big deal right now. Loving God and love is, is huge and greater than just knowing a lot of knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. And guys, when it comes to discussions of culture and differences of opinions within the Christian circles, man, there's a lot of arrogance out there. We can fight each other, and churches do, Christians do, fight each other on certain interpretations, certain cultural ways of living, of doing church. We can fight each other over that stuff. But the problem is it's not edifying. And that's where Paul, I think, wants to get to us and say, guys, let's edify each other, not be fighting each other. It's okay to have differences of opinions. You don't have to agree about every little detail there is. See, knowledge tries to correct. I've got to correct you, show you you're wrong. Make sure you see things my way. And Zachary's in that age, like the teenager, preteen, kind of watches a lot of science stuff, and he'll correct people. He'll be like, oh, that's wrong. I'm like, Zachary, you don't have to correct everybody all the time about everything. Any other have teenagers like that? They're always correcting you. Mommy, you just don't know. Love, though, seeks to edify, and it makes sure that people are growing. And here's something I learned, and seminary was so helpful. If you want to write this down, you can, or text it to yourself. Relationships sometimes is more important than winning an argument. Having a loving relationship with somebody is more important than always being right. And I think a lot of marriages could be saved if, if we just realize that my relationship with you is more important than me being correct about this argument, okay? Anyway, Paul continues. He says, now, concerning, now that we've talked about love being more important than just being right and arguing and knowledge, let's talk about things eaten and sacrificed to, animal, to idols, we know there's no such thing as an idol in the world, right? If this were like, oh, like there are gods in India that look like an elephant. Okay, there are elephant gods and idols that people worship in India today that is an elephant. So if this were an elephant god, like, oh, elephant god, we worship you. This cantaloupe has been sacrificed for you. Like, we know that there's, that there's nothing behind the elephant. It's just a blow-up doll. It's just an idol. It's not anything real. But to them, like, that's a real God. Okay? And so there's a huge, you know, for them, it's like, hey, this is serious. We worship that thing. And, and we know, though, as Christians, that's just an idol. There's nothing behind it. Because we know there's only one God, right? And you can't put him in a statue. You can't carve out a brick or rock or tree and make it God. That's still the tree. Uh, Isaiah even says, look, on one half of it, you make a pizza, and on the other half of it, you worship it. You know, the tree. It's ridiculous. Anyway, there are, we know there's so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, yet indeed there are many gods and many lords. Of course, there's many idols and gods that people worship, yet for us, there's only one God and Father from whom all things exist for him, one Lord Jesus Christ by whom all things, and we exist through him. So even our very existence is dependent on God, not elephant statue. Okay, so we know that, right? Are we all good on that? We know that, right, 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 right. Okay, good. Idols are not real. That's a principle here. Now, there are so-called gods, but they're not real. There's only one true God, right? But see, it starts getting more complicated. In 1 Corinthians 10, whoop, hello. He says, what do I mean then? 
that a thing sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? I mean, the meat is just meat. It's just fajita meat. And it's just an, an elephant blow up elephant or it's just an idol of an elephant. The meat is nothing and the elephant is nothing. All that matters is God. The idol is nothing. We know that. We know that, right? But, he says, I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice... In their hearts, what they're doing is sacrificing to demons and not to God. And I don't want to be a sharer or partaker with demons. So even though we know there's nothing in the idol, and even if it's a demon, guess what? Demons are what? They're losers. They're on the wrong side. God is the winner. We're on God's side. So we know that idol and idolatry is nothing. There's just, even if it's a demon, it's, it, demons are, we're, we're on the winning team, okay? So the principle continues, idols are not real, there are so-called gods, but actually they're demons in the worship of the people that are doing it, okay? They think there's a real God behind that statue, and they really think they're worshiping a real God. Now we know it's not God, it's a demon, even less, it's just nothing, it's a piece of wood. But then he goes on to say, but not all men have this knowledge. Not everybody sees it that way. Some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it was sacrificed to an idol. They're like, this is food. This fajita is given to Venus, and it matters, and I love Venus. And their conscience being weak, if they're a new believer, they're just coming out of Venus worship, they're like, well, I like the meat, though. I've eaten the meat all my life, so I like the meat, but I don't like Venus because there's only one God. And so... You know, Paul goes on to say, food will not commend us to God. We're neither the worse if we do not eat, or better if we do eat. It's not like you're more spiritual if you eat the Venus food, or the spiritual food, or not. It's not about food, folks. It's about your heart with the Lord. We're neither the worse if we don't, or better if we do. But take care, and this is where it gets kind of dicey, take care that the liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. So, he's saying idols are not real. There's a lot of false gods out there, and they're actually demons to some people. But not everybody see things the way you do. And of course, there is only one God. But not everybody sees things. Okay, look, I'll give you an illustration of a, mo a modern day illustration of this, where Christians are divided on an issue, and they do not see it the same way. Is it a sin to eat candy? Anybody? No. Now, some of our healthy freaks would say, yes, it is evil. <laughs> but in and of itself, is it a sin to give a child a piece of candy? No. We did it on BBS. We were giving kids candy all day long. We had these little suckers with this little lion on it. Is it a sin to get dressed up in a costume? Anybody? Like a little Popeye outfit or dress up like a pilgrim or something? Is it a sin? No. Now, is it a sin to give away candy and get dressed up on October 31st? Oh, wait a minute there. Some people are like, yes, it is a sin. Other people are like, no, it's not a sin. And they're divided. There are, there are Christians who have a clear conscience. They say October 31st, people are worshiping Satan. It's a day dedicated to evil. And so therefore, it would be sinful for us to participate in anything on October 31st. We, you know, if they really took it to an extreme, you'd be like, just stay in bed and pray all day because this evil is out there. That's just it's being facetious and over-exaggerating. On the other side, there's people that say, well... Satan doesn't own October 31st. Every day is the Lord's day, okay? So we're not even going to give Satan the, the acknowledgement of him having a day. He doesn't. If people are worshiping Satan on that day, that's their bad. And I want to reach out to people. So I'm going to have all these little pagans coming to my door asking for candy. And I'm going to open my door and give them candy and smile and tell them I love them, tell them Jesus loves them, and give them a Bible thing and invite them to church. And so some would say, you are evil in participating in Halloween by doing that. Others would say, you're just really miss, missing the whole point of why we're here. We, we should be loving people and God does, you know, Satan doesn't own 
that day, October 31st. And there's Christians that have fought over that. They've even split churches over that. They've quit fellowshipping with one another. Because, well, I don't go to those churches that celebrate Halloween, and, or they're so legalistic. And blah, blah, blah. My attitude is this. If you have a conscience about that, do not participate in it. By all means, please do not. And pray. Pray against evil. Pray against demons. And do, you know, do what you have to do to follow God in your conscience. And if you feel okay to give candy and, and dress up and tell people about Jesus on that day, do that. I'm not going to take a side. And people go, you're just wishy-washy, John. No, I'm not. I really believe you both have a good argument there. And so you do follow your conscience. If, if you say it's a sin, I'm going to say, good for you. I, go for it. If you say it's okay, I'm going to share Christ with people on that day and give them candy, okay, go for it. This is an example of what we're, saying, what we're talking about here. Christians were wondering what to do about this, this temple stuff and this false idols. And we're still in the same place of, over different issues. He goes on, Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 8, 10 through 13. If anyone sees you who has knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he's weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For though your knowledge, for through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, and the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their consciences when it's weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. And so Paul kind of like, look, I'm a Bible study teacher. I was teaching the Bible on Sunday. And then you see me at the temple with the idol buying a cantaloupe that's been sacrificed to the temple. And you used to worship that idol. Maybe you'd be tempted to go, well, maybe that Christian, if he's getting the, the, the worship, worshiping the idol, maybe I should keep worshiping the idol. And that's where the lines get crossed. It gets a little fuzzy. And people start going, what do I do? What do I do? And Paul says, look, in order to not cause my brother to stumble, I'm not going to get that meat at the temple. It's almost like he's saying two things. We'll talk about that a little bit. But I see a principle here. There's a weak conscience. Why is this person called weak, okay? That, oh, you're eating temple of food that was sacrificed in the temple. That's bad. You shouldn't be doing that. Why is that person considered weak? I think they're considered weak because they are unsure. They're, they're like wishy-washy, like, well, is the, is the idol of God? Is it really God? Is God God or the idol of God? And are you giving that idol power by giving it, you know, rain over the cantaloupe. Now this cantaloupe is evil because it's been sacrificed to that idol. Really? Does, and so when you're kind of weak and you're not sure, you, you, you maybe you think maybe the can, man, cantaloupe is tainted now. I, I've got friends who are Buddhists and they sacrifice their oranges to Buddha. And then they'll say, here, take an orange. It's just been sacrificed to Buddha. And the, do I do it? Do I not? And there's a doubt. And there's a principle, by the way, when people ask me, is it okay to do this or that? Every pastor gets that. And I'm sure if you're a Christian, been one for a long time, your friends will come up to you. Oh, you're a Christian, right? Yes, yes, I'm a Christian. Oh, is it okay to go to the bar? Is it okay to go? You know, they have all these questions. And, and part of me is just like, if you're in doubt, don't do it. If you have any doubt, just don't do it. Okay? If you're not sure, don't do it. You know, but there's things like this. Here's a list here of a few things. Like, you can have a party with your family, or you can party with your family. See the difference there? <laughs> and when you, let's say your family used to have these huge, you know, what they call it, pachangas, you know, like a big old party. I'm like keggers, right? And your family had these big, huge drinking parties, and you become a Christian. Now, do you go spend time with your family at the big kegger party? Or do you not? The answer is, I don't know. You see, that's not for me to figure out. It's for you to figure out. See, because I'm not going to make a law commanding you. I want you to have your own conscience about it. If you have a clear conscience that you can go to your family's party 
and not be blindingly drunk and horribly lose your testimony as a Christian. You know, you can go and say, hey, I'm here. This is my family. I love you guys. Here, get drunk with us. Nope, sorry, I'm not going to do that. I love you guys, and I'm here to hang out with you guys. I just support you. I love you as my family. I'm a Christian now. I don't drink. If you can do that, then go to the party. But if for you, going to the party, you're going to say, yeah, give me another and give me another, and then you're going to end up totally drunk, and they're going to go see what kind of Christian he is, maybe you shouldn't go to the party. And for you, going to that party would be actually sin, sinful. You know, or if someone in your family struggles with that, and they're a new believer, then maybe I shouldn't go for his sake so that he's not going to stumble. Okay, this is important. And it's not just parties. It's, it's having a glass of wine. One glass of wine, is that a sin? Well, the Bible never says alcohol in and of itself is a sin. Being drunk is always a sin, though. There are some people who can have a glass of alcohol and they're fine. It's the end of it. There are other people who have one, they can't stop. It's got to be one, two, three, ten, twenty, passed out on the floor. And so it really depends. Some people, can, does anyone here, have you been shopping recently? Do you like to go shopping? The man, he's like, no, not really. <laughs> Sorry, I'm asking the wrong person. Do you like to go shopping? She's like, yes. Okay, is shopping a sin? No? You're so quick to answer. <laughs> so quick to answer. No, it is not a sin. John David, don't you put that on me. Listen, shopping, if you go shopping and you have budget and you have controlled budget and you take care of your stuff and you buy something, go for it. That's fine. If you can not control yourself. There are people who cannot stop. They shop and they spend all their rent money and they destroy their family budget and then they start fighting and destroying their marriage and destroying their children. Yes, shopping is sinful at that point because you're destroying. Your uncontrollable habit is destroying your family. I, I did not say shopping is sinful. I said it depends on your heart. If you worship material things and you can't control your budget, then it turns into a sin, yes. Exercise, keeping him fit. Some people have even given testimony, I was worshiping myself. I worshiped my own body and I worshiped exercise and I was over-exercising and became my God. Watching a movie. Is it a sin to watch a movie? Well, it depends on what movie maybe, part of it. Part of the question is there. But also why and how often and how much. If you're sitting there binge watching movies all day long and you don't have a job, you're not taking care of your family, then maybe it's a problem. And yeah, you need to deal with that. Wearing makeup. Is it sin to wear makeup? Some churches, there are some people from some churches who would fight me, argue over it, and get mad and offended that I will not say having makeup is a sin. I can't say it. It can be, though. If your heart is full of vanity and all you care about is the way you look and you worship your image, then yeah, it can be a sin. See, this is where it's not so easy. So I used to be like so black and white. And there are things black and white. Don't get me wrong. There are some clear black and white things in the Bible. But then there's a whole lot of areas like, eh, it depends. I don't know. Going to the beach of sin? I don't know. Depends on why you're there and what you're doing there and who you're doing it with. It all depends. It really is. It's, it's, a, it's a messy thing. You know, and then the, the question about, like, involvement. You go, well, you know, I'm not going to go to that store because they've done, you know, they support a type of marriage that I do not support, okay? Let's say that's your case, okay? There's a lot of people boycott stuff all the time. Christians boycotting stuff, right? It's like, we need to go to Chick-fil-A because they're the Christian place to eat. And all those other taquerias are evil, you know, piratas are evil because they're not holy Chick-fil-A food. I know there's people that think Chick-fil-A is more spiritual because it's owned by Christians. And so we think like, oh, that's Christian food. You know, well, what? Did non-Christians invent a car? So now you're not going to drive a car because a non-Christian invented a car. And now you're not going to um, use a computer because a non-Christian invented computers. And so computers are evil. And, 
you know, and pagans invented the tables and chairs, so now we're not going to sit and eat. Or who invented the toothbrush and who invented the light switch and carpet and all? You know, you could just go, you know, if you want to be really holy and pure, just lock yourself in a room and never see anybody ever. That's where we end up sometimes with some of these questions. But Paul goes on to say, all things are lawful. I have liberty. And, and really, he's quoting, uh, the. it's kind of like, whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. He's kind of quoting it like that. All things are lawful. That was a famous Ro- Roman saying. A- anything's good. It's all lawful. Like right in, today in some states, you know, marijuana is lawful. So I could go as this pastor of this church, go to Colorado, smoke a joint, and go, hey, it's legal, and it is legal, but it's not permissible or profitable. And that's where we get into, we have to be very careful where we, as we walk. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. Go to the next verse, please. First, uh, First Corinthians 10, 20. All things are lawful, but not all things, and here's the big one, edify. Are we loving our neighbor and edifying them, or is it just about what I want and what I can get? Sometimes people come, hey, pastor, is it okay for me to do this? You know, whatever the thing is, get a tattoo, um, drink a beer, uh, go to a rated arm. Is it okay to do these things, pastor? And part of me goes, the whole premise of your question is selfish. You're starting out with me. Can I do this? And I think Paul would say, and Christ would say, change the whole question. What can I do that edifies others? And maybe they'll answer that. I went to the beach because it edifies my wife and my family to be away and relax. If I was there because I want to drink and look at the girls and blah, 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 then that's a whole nother problem. And it is wrong to go to the beach if that were the case. You know, so just because I can do something doesn't mean I should do it. And so anyway, Paul goes on to say, if anyone says to you, this is meat sacrificed to an idol, do not eat it. Wait a minute. Didn't he just say earlier if someone invites you to their house, a non-believer invites you to their house, and they offer you meat, don't ask any questions and eat it? Didn't he just say eat it, and now he's saying don't eat it? Here's how it works. This is the way I look at it. Someone goes to your house and said, let's have some cantaloupe. Don't ask any questions, just eat. Okay, let's have some cantaloupe. But if someone said, hey, let's go have some cantaloupe, and then they go, and by the way, did you know that we just sacrificed this cantaloupe to Buddha? And in eating this cantaloupe, you and I are participating in a ritual sacrifice and worship of Buddha. Oh, well, if that's what that means, no, I'm not eating the cantaloupe. See? And that's why I ask the question, is it a sin to eat this cantaloupe? And the true answer is, maybe. (laughs) It depends. And that's, you see, Christians don't like blurry things sometimes. But the reality is there's a lot of things that are blurry. Yeah, it really depends. If you're, if, if I'm with, and here's, look, I have the, a little chart here. I got lost world with its idols and Christ followers of God. So here's the lost world with its idols. It's like, oh, we worship the pagan God and we sacrifice this cantaloupe to you, God, and now we're going to eat it in worshiping you. That's the k- pagan world and its idols. Here's the Christian like, thank you, God. I love cantaloupe. You're awesome, God. Oh, I worship you as I enjoy this cantaloupe. You are an awesome God, right? Then the two of them meet And the pagan goes, you want some cantaloupe? And I'm like, sure, praise the Lord, I have some cantaloupe. And then the pagan says, but in eating it, we're worshiping a false god together. Then I have to say no. Or, and that's where the next slide comes in. There's the lost world, there's Christ followers, and then there's the new believer who's just now figuring this whole thing out. And if I'm alone with the new believer, I'll probably say, hey, Those guys worshiping a false god with this cantaloupe, they're so wrong. This is just a cantaloupe that God created. Come, let's enjoy it. But then if the new believer and uh, and a false god guy are together in the room, 
I'll tell the new believer, let's not eat that because he thinks we're worshiping with him in that false god, so let's not eat it. And the new believer's like, okay, we won't eat it. So sometimes you eat the cantaloupe, and sometimes you don't eat the cantaloupe. And that's where we have to start getting into these, you know, avoiding, you know, I'll avoid movies if I'm with an entertainment, a recovering entertainment junkie. Or, you know, I won't go to Las Vegas for someone who struggled with gambling addictions. You know, you struggle with gambling addictions, almost destroyed your family because you're gambling. I'm not going to sit there and go, let's plan a trip to Las Vegas, buddy. Let's a family friend outing. No, 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 no. I'll avoid, if somebody has a problem with being an exercising addi- addict, I'm not going to be like, let's go exercise a bunch. I'll be like, let's have some choco flan, buddy. <laughs> you know, there are some people who are offended by shoes. Those shoes remind me of my past life when I was a dancer or when I was a stripper. And so I'm not going to get fancy shoes because it reminds me of that life. So you know what? I'm not going to get shoes while I'm around that person. We have to be, basically Paul is saying, be sensitive, be loving, be caring about who you're with and what you're doing. If someone is coming out of the occult, then you know what? I'm not going to invite them to the church Halloween outreach. (laughs) They're getting out of the occult. They used to worship Satan on that night. Maybe they don't need to be there. Maybe we should just have a prayer time at their house. Things like that. These are all things, and there's no clear cut yes or right. And here's where Paul comes to the conclusion, and I love this verse, and I think it's good for us as we navigate culture here. Whether then you eat or drink, whatever you do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether then you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. But then he says this, Give no offense to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Three groups of people. There's the, the Jewish pagan, the Jewish people who don't know God or don't know Jesus and they know God their way and they struggle with foods. There's the pagans who have their issues with foods. They go sacrifice them to idols. And then there's the church who's a mixture of all of that. And he's like, hey, be sensitive. Give no offense to Jews. Just as I also please all men in all things, why? Not seeking my own profit, but the benefit of the many, so they may be saved. And that's where it really gets down to it. Are we sensitive, culturally sensitive to the people around us? Not to be culturally sensitive, as the world thinks of it, but to be sensitive to where they're at, so that I can find ways to not offend them, but also draw them into Christ. That is my goal. Lord, how can I be aware? How can I be culturally aware? Did I tell you all the story about the the Mexican Baptists and the Spanish Baptists from Spain? Well, the Mexican Baptists and the Spanish Baptists had a world congress together where all these Baptists from all these countries, the Hispanic countries, got together. And the Mexican Baptists were criticizing the Spanish Baptists from Spain because the Spanish Baptists at dinner were having a glass of wine with their dinner. And if you've ever been to Europe, everybody drinks wine with dinner or beer in Germany. Even the Christians, even the evangelicals, even the Baptists. And so the Mexican Baptists were looking at those crazy, evil Spanish Baptists like they are drinking a glass of wine with their dinner. Even their children. Oh my goodness, that's so evil. And then the Spanish Baptists from Spain heard that the Mexican Baptists would go to bullfights and not have a problem with it. And the Spanish Baptists were like, you guys are, are evil. You're so, you're like, you cruelty to animals and you support it and you, you're a part of that. How could you? That's not spiritual at all. And they were fighting against each other. One over wine and the other one over bullfighting. And that's a true story. They're really, really, they're Spanish Baptists who think Mexican Baptists are crazy for supporting bullfights. So what do we do with all this? Do what Paul says. Eat, drink for the glory of God, but seek to not offend, to be sensitive so that people can be saved. And so I've got four points here I want to end with. First of all, worship God, not idols, okay? The world is lost. And there are idols in the world, even though there aren't shrines and idols. This this could be an idol to somebody, okay? A video game could be an idol to somebody. 
A car could be an idol, a movie, a culture of movies, all of that. You know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I, uh, canon. You know what I'm talking about? They've even made it canon. You know what canon is? Canon is a word for scripture. It means the rule. What books are part of the Bible? That's what it meant originally. Now they say there's a canon for the Marvel Universe. That whatever they did in the movies is canon. And if there's anything else that's not part of the movies, that's not officially Marvel. They did that with the Star Wars. With Star Wars canon, the true Star Wars stories, not the little ones that are written by other people that aren't true Star Wars. It's ridiculous. That's worship. Okay, that's an idol. Okay. So anyway, our pagan, the world worships idols. Let's worship God, not idols, number one. Number two, if you're, forgi- if you're a Christian, you're forgiven and free. You're free. You want the cantaloupe? Eat the cantaloupe. Okay? Eat it. Even if it was, worship, it was sacrificed to a million false gods, eat it. That's okay. But you're bound by love. So maybe you shouldn't eat it if you're going to cause someone else to stumble and offend them. And so maybe you shouldn't eat the cantaloupe. Did I confuse everybody enough? I hope so, because it is confusing. <laughs> but that's okay, because it makes us think, guys. Let's think through stuff and be sensitive to others and love others, because we're bound by love, and finally, don't be selfish. It's not just about what, all that you want, what you can get. Think about what you can give to the culture. How can we give Christ to people? How can we give the love of God to people? How can we find ways to navigate these things that honors people but doesn't get us into, you know, worshiping their gods with them? How can we do that in a way that honors and loves and then, here's the key, brings people to a knowledge of Christ? So, you know, this is tough. This is a tough sermon. This is a tough discussion, but I think it's it's good to have because the Bible has this discussion. We should have it and we should be aware of it so we can move and share Christ with people in a way that honors them. Let's pray.